Welcome to the online worship service of the Salvation Army, Lindsay Community Church, for February 21st, 2021. Good morning, church family, and others that are joining with us, whether that is this morning or sometime later. We are so glad that you're joining with us, and our hope is that you feel the presence of the Lord as we worship together. There are a number of prayer concerns that always come up, and if you have any that we as a congregation can pray for, please either let me or Mia know, and we will send those out to the congregation. Please keep those in prayer that are on our health prayer list, Major Linda Balmer, Joanna Gosselin, and Shannon Switzer, and those in nursing homes, Morley Danes and Lucy Pelly. And speaking of Lucy Pelly, she contacted me this week and advised that the McLaughlin Crescent Care had not had a positive te test since a week ago Friday, which is absolutely wonderful news. And uh, But please continue to pray for the residents and the staff and for the families of those residents uh, who have passed due to con co covid uh, Bible studies start back up next week via Zoom. Monday night Bible study will be starting uh, Monday, March 1st. We will be studying the book of James with Francis Chan. The book of James speaks to the realities of living faith in Jesus, the kind of rolled up, roll up your sleeves and get your hands dirty discipleship that is born out of an authentic relationship with the risen Lord. All are welcome and we'd love to have you join us, so please contact me if you're interested. The Ladies' Bible Study will be restarting on Thursday, March 4th. They will be doing a study on Elijah. There is a book involved in the study, so please contact Marcia Coombs if you'd like to join in on Thursdays. I want to thank all who remember to send their tithes and offerings into the church. Part of worship is the giving of tithes and offerings to God, and, and being a part like we are, um, the giving of tithes and offerings gets separated from our worship on Sunday. Please make this a part of your worship at home as you prayerfully consider supporting our church and the Lord's work here in Lindsay. Call to worship this morning is from God's Word, Psalm 36, 5 to 7. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains, your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O oh God. Joyful, joyful, we adore you, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before you, opening to the sun above. The clouds of sin and sadness strive the dark of doubt away. Giver of eternal gladness, fill us with the light of day. You are the one who saves. You are the one who saves. You are the one whose hands lift us from the grave.
of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before you, opening to the sun above. You are the one who saves. You are the one who saves. You are the one whose hands lift us from the grave. You are the light of light, the everlasting day. You are the one who takes all our sins away. Hi everyone. Hi. Hi. So we're gonna watch a video together about a story that I know you guys um, have heard before because um, we talked about it um, just a week ago. Um, but we're gonna watch a Lego video um, of the story of the Good Samaritan from Luke chapter 10 verses 25 to 37. A man was going from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. Let's go! Ah! Get him! They stripped Don't him of his clothes. Get, get his clothes! Beat him. Ouch! Ouch! Yeah. And went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, took pity on him. Hey, buddy, are you okay? Uh, Let me help you. Uh, I have some bandages uh, here. Uh, Let's get you up. Uh, uh, here, you can ride up there. Keeper, do you have any rooms? I need to take care of this man. Sure, come on in. Thanks. Here you go, let's get you fixed up. Morning. Good morning. Here's two denari. Please look after him. When I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you have. Banana. <laughs> okay, so in the video, there were two people that um, walked by the Samaritan. Do you remember who they were? Oh. Elliot, you tell me one. A Levite. Yep. And Bram, I think you had your hand up before. A priest? Yep. And a priest. Um, they, and neither of them stopped to help, did they? No. Why do you think they didn't stop? Because they didn't care. That could be one reason. Bram said because they didn't care. Can anyone... There isn't really a wrong answer if you can think of other reasons why they might not have stopped. Maybe they just thought they had better things to do. Yeah, maybe they were busy. Um, they didn't stop by because, um, what was I going to say again? 
I have to figure out all this stuff. Okay, well, if you remember, then you can just tell me, okay? Um, anyone else with an idea of why they didn't stop? Maybe they didn't know what to do or how to help. Have you ever felt like that? Yeah, me too. Uh, if someone, if you guys were walking along and you saw someone who was on the ground hurt, do you think you would stop and help them? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the third person came along and he did stop and help, didn't he? And what was he called? Megan. Um, oh, I forgot. That's with an S. Oh, a Samaritan. Yep. Um, so now Megan and Owen, we talked about this a lot last week, were the Samaritans and the person who was hurt, he was called a Jew. Were they good friends, the Samaritans and the Jewish people? No, they weren't. Um, so it was sort of out of the ordinary for a Samaritan to stop and help a Jew uh, because they really did not get along. They didn't like each other. So that makes it even more amazing that the Samaritan um, stopped. So it's a great story because Jesus wanted us to know that that's what we should do. It doesn't matter if we like the person or if we know the person. It's a person. And if they're hurt or if they need help, what should we do? Help. Yeah, we should help. Um, and what if we don't know what to do? Because even adults sometimes don't know how to help. So if we see someone who's hurt or needs help, what could we do if we don't know what to do? Megan? Go find someone that's older and knows how to help. Yep, that's a great idea. Okay, so I'm going to pray with you guys before we close, okay? God, thank you so much for this group. And I just pray that as we're out and about, that you help us to remember that you love everyone. And that means no matter who it is, if we see someone who needs help, that we should try our best to help them. And please show us how to do this and, um, and help us to remember to be kind to everyone. Amen.
the fountain Dip your heart in the streams of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away In the waves of His mercy As deep cries out Good morning, church family. Did you realize that it was three years ago today that American evangelist Billy Graham was, as we say in the Salvation Army, promoted to glory? Can you imagine the homecoming that he had when he arrived before our Savior? If you ever had the chance to visit Billy Graham Library just outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, I would highly, highly recommend it. I've been there twice and each time was really, really special. The exhibits take you on a journey through Mr. Graham's life, and every step of the way you see how the man acknowledged the Savior, and he pointed people to Christ. 
That was his reason for living. And when you go through that library, you see that that was his reason for living. Whether you're a fan or not of this man, we have to recognize that he was obedient to the call to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to all nations. Maybe one day I'll give you a slideshow of the library. Trust me, I have a lot of pictures. But you see how Billy's life had strong godly influences right from his birth and being raised on the farm to his final days at home in Montreat, North Carolina. Graham acknowledged not only his need for a savior, but everyone's need for a savior. He didn't discriminate, and if ever there was a good Samaritan, it would be him. So why mention him today? Well, I guess I just wanted to encourage you to share the gospel, because we're all called to do that. Some of us do it from a pulpit. Others do it from the com comfort of the kitchen table. Whether you find yourself this week, wherever it is, live a life that is worthy of the call. In our corporate time just now, I want to share a prayer based on one of the prayers found in the book Moments with the Savior by Ken Geyer. Why not close your eyes and listen to what God is saying specifically to you right now? Father, Lord, Savior, give us a heart of compassion that we may love our neighbor the way the Good Samaritan loved his. Give us eyes that do not look away and feet that do not turn to the other side of the road. Who is our neighbor, Lord? Is it the shut-in, stripped of independence by arthritis, beaten down by the years, hanging on to life by a thread? Is it the AIDS victim, stripped of a long life, battling this insidious virus, life silently flickering away unnoticed in a hospice somewhere? Is my neighbor the unhoused person, stripped of home, broken by the hard reality of pavement, kept alive by the pocket change of a few strangers? Is it the one on the street, stripped of dignity, controlled by harmful substances, half-starved, rummaging through a dumpster for their daily bread? Is my neighbor the person next door, stripped of their happiness, suffering mental illness, looking for a way out? Is it the owner of a business downtown, stripped of assets, battered by the economy, whose business is, is now bankrupt, all because someone didn't stay home? Are they my neighbor? Deep down inside, Lord, our hearts know the answer. We don't have to ask. Each person we meet, we are to respect and value, recognizing everyone's worth as we are all equal in your eyes. Everyone is our neighbor. Help me to love. Help us to love as you do. Deliver us from hardened emotions with look, which look at your beloved people on the side of the road with a tear in our eye, but without the least intention of helping. Impress upon our hearts, Lord, that the smallest act of kindness is better than the greatest of kind intentions. Help us, your people, to realize that although we cannot do everything to alleviate the suffering in this world, we can do something. And even if that something is a very little thing, it's better than turning and walking away. Amen. Good morning, church family. Here we are in a different environment yet again. And uh, Bob and I were privileged to be able to take some holidays this week. And I must admit, I forgot to bring my uniform on holidays. I know. So this morning, I ask your forgiveness. I am preaching in another black and white, but uh, same person with or without the uniform. So I trust that you'll hear where my heart is this morning and that um, you join me wherever and whenever you're listening. And uh, I just pray that God uh, speaks to you through the words um, that he's spoken to me this week. Over the next six weeks leading up to Easter, Bob and I will be taking some of our thoughts and ideas from a book called Moments with the Savior by Ken Geyer. We'll be looking at the journey up to the crucifixion and resurrection of our Lord through the eyes of different people who were there at the time of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and more specifically through the windows that they observed their life through. We want to dive a bit deeper into seeing what the first century people saw, feel what they felt, and possibly even learn what they learned. 
When we arrived here in Lindsay to our new home, the first thing I noticed besides the big tree in the front yard and then a double car garage was large windows at the front of our house. Now there weren't any doors, but that's a whole other story. But there were large windows at the front of our house and I couldn't wait to have supper at the dining room table looking out over the street and watching the people go by. I'm a people watcher and over the last 11 months, even that has become difficult with all the restrictions that are in place. And I don't know about you, but I have to be in the right mood to clean windows, which isn't very often, I have to admit. The windows were great, Robin and Jerry, good job. <laughs> but not all the windows that I viewed life through have been very spotless either, as I'm sure folks in Jesus' time could witness to as well. In fact, they didn't even have glass. Some were made similar to fishing nets on hinges. Um, they were kept closed when it was sunny and it allowed the air to flow through the lattice and opened at night to bring in more cool air and the little light that there was. But they were still windows and this will be the theme over the next few weeks. Thank you to the Pattinson Production family for our children's time this morning and the retelling of one of the most familiar parables in scripture, the Good Samaritan found in Luke chapter 10. The question is asked by a lawyer who seemed more intent on settling his uneasy conscience than to debate. And Jesus poses the answer to this question, who is my neighbor, in the most unpredicted of places on a dusty road leading out of Jerusalem. Now the walk between Jerusalem and Jericho is about 18 miles. It takes maybe eight hours or so. It's downhill for the most part. And most of the trip is done in very barren and dry areas. But first making it through the hills were anything but easy. The road from Jerusalem to Jericho slopes steadily downward through a wilderness of rocks and gorges and powdery ledges of limestone. Everywhere you look was the same dusty, sandy beige color, except when the sun was rising and streaks of pink could be seen across the sky and the hills. The road wound down through the hills like a snake and often came precariously close to the edge of the steep ravines on either side, making it not an easy journey. Now add to the terrain criminals who waited in the crevices for unsuspecting travelers. The people listening to Jesus tell this story would know exactly the picture that he was painting for them. Growing up, when I heard this story, I could picture the priest stopping, crossing the street, walking for a bit, then coming back to the side he originally started on once he had passed the injured man. That was my window that I was looking through. But this was not what his audience would have pictured, as many of them would have taken that road going up from Jericho to Jerusalem for their holy days. At some point, this road is so narrow that passers-by would have to literally step over each other, and especially if there was a body on the road, which makes the story even more compelling. The road was so treacherous in places that it was also known as the way of blood. Now down the road comes a tired priest. The robbers recognize him to be a religious man from the clothes that he wears, and so they allow him safe passage. Some things are sacred even to criminals. Besides, the reason probably was because priests never carried anything of value anyway, and it'd be kind of a waste of time and energy. For the last eight days, the priest had been in the temple from morning till night where he served and taught people in the straight and narrow ways of the law. For the times the Jewish people had strayed, he interceded on their behalf, burning incense, saying prayers and offering sacrifices. The days were long and tiresome, and he had to give total attention to every minute detail that he was to perform. He did everything from listening and trying legal cases to checking the wicks of the temple oil lamps. Some of our older officer colleagues may even remember a time when they not only had to be plumber and bookkeeper, but also collector of firewood and even donations so they could put food on their table. But now the priest is off duty and he's on his way home to Jericho, the worldly suburb of the Holy City. I don't think at the end of my work week, I would want to walk eight hours, even if it was mostly downhill. The priest passes the time by meditating on a psalm, but the rhythm of Hebrew poetry comes to an abrupt stop when he hears the guttural moans coming along the roadside. There lies a man naked and crushed who has been beaten raw and has been bleeding. 
The priest thinks the man is a Jew, but is he really? The law says that if you see your brother's donkey or ox fall down by the way, you should not hide yourself from it, but you should help it up. And how much more then should you help if your brother himself has fallen? But that's not the portion of the law that comes to the priest's mind. He thinks of the passage which says that anyone who touches a dead person shall be rendered unclean for seven days. Clinical versus compassion, legalism at its best. The priest reasons to himself, the poor man's barely alive. If I stop and help him, he could die in my arms. And then he thinks of the elaborate ritual that he'd have to go through to purify himself. And frankly, he's had enough of rituals for one week. Besides, if the priest is rendered unclean, that would interfere with his religious duties at the local synagogue in Jericho. And he's supposed to teach Torah classes all the following week. So instead of risking the defilement that would keep him from fulfilling his religious responsibilities the following week, the priest just turns and walks away. After all, teaching is his gift, and it wouldn't be wise to use his time or talents to have to stay in isolation for a week because he helped someone like this. Next is the Levite. He's coming down the road. He's an assistant to the priest and helps with temple worship. But he too is off work and itching to get back to Jericho. He's in a rush because he has to get back for a council meeting where he has been asked to give the opening invocation. It's a real honor for him and it could lead to more opportunities and will definitely give him more visibility and a greater circle of influence in the community. The doors that could be open to him if he does this well, would give him opportunities to rub shoulders with the council members and top merchants and people of society. And those people were always good givers and knew how to treat their holy men. And once you were in with the right crowd, well, that could make all the difference in your life in the community. Key leaders, important people, you on the same level as them. He might even be able to make some extra money on the side. Have you ever given up an opportunity to be with someone or speak to someone or give to someone because you were late for band practice or you just needed to get those goods sorted so that everybody could benefit from the greater good? Well, lying in the path again was this man. He was an interruption to the thoughts of climbing the social ladder for the Levite, a man who had been beaten by robbers. He looks at the man, then raises his eyes to the angle of the sun and sees he's got to get going if he's going to make it on time for the meeting. Surely someone would come along in a few minutes. He thinks as he steps past and possibly even over the unconscious man. Well, you know who comes next, right? The Samaritan, riding on a donkey down a dusty stretch of road. He's been in Jerusalem on business and is on his way to Jericho for more business. The business climate in Judea is not favorable towards Samaritans and Jews don't even receive them in their homes, believing that if they did, they would be storing up curses on their children. Eating with Samaritans in their mind was the same as eating at a pig's trough. The hatred is so intense that Jews publicly cursed them in the synagogue, asking God to exclude them from eternal life. Now, that's some heavy prejudice, isn't it? Very sad. The Samaritan tries to shake off the rude ways that he's been treated, having seen his own people treated, treating the Jews just as badly, when he rounds a bend in the road and sees the wounded man lying there. The Samaritan's heart compels him to stop. His compassion is so great, he knows what he has to do. He knows he's a Jew, but it makes no difference what race, what religion, what region of the country this man is from. He is a human being in need. And as far as the Samaritan is concerned, that's all that matters. From his heavily packed donkey, he takes a wine skin and an earthen jar of oil. He rushes to the man's side and pours wounds, wine on his wounds to disinfect them. And then he pours oil over it to soothe them. He tears strips from his garments to sop up the blood, and gingerly he shoulders the man onto his donkey, steadying him as he walks by his side. He knew there was an inn a few miles away, and it's there that he spends the night tending to the victim's wounds and giving him water whenever he regained consciousness. 
Now the next day, the Samaritan has to be on his way for business, but the wounded man is too critical to travel. So the Samaritan empties his leather pouch into the innkeeper's palms and two silver coins, which in that time was the equivalent of two days wages, fall out. The Samaritan not only goes out on a financial limb for the man, but he goes into debt, obligating himself for any expenses that the innkeeper may incur while nursing this total stranger back to health. The Samaritan will even be back to follow up on the man he helped. As far as we know, the Samaritan did nothing for the stranger's soul. He uttered no prayer. He didn't quote any verse of scripture. He left no tract, not even a war cry. All he did was give the man the physical help that he needed. And that seemed to be enough. At least it was enough in the eyes of the one who told the story. Do you remember who was telling the story? Jesus. In demonstrating what it meant to be a good neighbor, the Samaritan defined the meaning of love. Love doesn't look away. It doesn't walk away. It involves itself. It inconveniences itself. It indebts itself. When Jesus concludes the story, he asks the legal expert, which of these proved to be the neighbor? Now, the stately Jewish man almost choked on his answer. He can't quite bring himself to say even the word Samaritan. All he can say is the one who showed him mercy. Jewish hatred towards the Samaritan was both racial and religious. Samaritans were half-breeds, a mixture of Jewish and Assyrian blood. And from the Jewish perspective, they were heretics. Samaritans worshipped at a temple on Mount Gerizim, in defiance to the Jewish temple up in Jerusalem. They accepted only the first five books of the Bible of their sacred scripture known as the Torah rather than the entire Jewish Old Testament. They established their own priesthood independent from the one Jews had and they disregarded the traditions of the Jewish elders. Knowing Jewish sentiment towards Samaritans, can you imagine how hard it must have been for the Jewish legal expert to have the central commandment in Jewish law illustrated to him by a man whose race he utterly despised? Just a chapter earlier in Luke's gospel, the, an entire Samaritan village rejected Jesus. It said in Luke 9 verses 52 to 56, he sent messengers on ahead. They went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him, but the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. Knowing that Jesus was a Jew and realizing his recent rejection by the Samaritans, you would think that he would have cast the Samaritan in the role of the man who fell among thieves, or worse, one of the men who turned away. But Jesus didn't do it. He made the Samaritan the hero of the story. The hero. When the disciples wanted to curse the Samaritans for their unneighborly attitude, Jesus blessed them instead by using one of them as an example of everything good a neighbor should be. Jesus gave blessing in place of curse. That's how the Savior lived, isn't it? That's how he died. And maybe in the final analysis, that is the most instructive thing about this parable, how we're to live. Now, of course, a lot has been added to this story to help us understand a bit better the context of why Jesus told this parable, but Ken Geyer's account helps us see through the lens or window of those up close to the situation. I, don't, I didn't know when I was little that it was not a four-laned road that this priest was walking down, but a path so rough and narrow that it was hard to walk. It was only through studying that I was able to learn the context of what was going on. And that is what we hope over the next few weeks we're able to do and journey and learn along with you. Not to manipulate the text, but to present it in such a way as it makes some very familiar portions of scripture come alive in a new way. This story is about mercy and mercy doesn't require reason. The Samaritan, the hero, identifies with the needs of the stranger and has compassion on him. One commentator wrote that Jesus turned the tables on the lawyer asking the question, 
Jesus wanted the lawyer to see who the neighbor was to the victim. Jesus forced him to put a name to the face, not just acknowledge an anonymous person or group of people. Jesus also made it very simple and practical. In that day, Jews loved to debate. In his telling of this parable, there was no debate. The Samaritan was the neighbor. Have you ever looked back at the end of the day and thought, why didn't I talk to that person? Or maybe even said, hmm, I should have made time for them. Often we miss opportunities to become better people and good stewards of what God has given us because we simply don't take the time or overthink everything and maybe even the repercussions that would interrupt our time and energy. This parable is not about us doing more. It really is about being more. Jesus wasn't saying you have to help your neighbor if you want to achieve eternal life. He wasn't saying by doing more good, you will be seen as more deserving. This is about our love for God and what is the product of it, loving and caring for others. We do because we love Father. It's that simple. The lawyer was trying to trick Jesus with the law of the first five books of the Hebrew scriptures, but Jesus cannot be tricked. Jesus knows our hearts and it's in his mercy, desires us to know the Father's love through knowing him. And from that place should come our love for our neighbors. We are on a journey together, discovering what it's like to be like Jesus every day and in all situations that we find ourselves in. We are shown that the best way, the God way desires us to do this together as a body of Christ. Do you desire to know him? Do you want to know him more? We will draw closer to him as we draw closer to others in loving them and caring for our neighbor. As we approach our holy time of year, I encourage you to seek what Father wants for your life. What is it that we're, we're in need of? What is it that we need to let go of? Is there something material? Maybe it's something inside you just can't surrender. Maybe you find too much idle time and at this point in our history, well, that's a reality for many of us, isn't it? Well, our problems are real and Father wants us, to, wants us to know that we can take them to him. Maybe we need to take baby steps in breaking old habits and developing new ones. Maybe we sit in a quiet place and allow our minds to declutter so that we can better hear what God has to say to us. Whatever your situation right now is, God wants to grant you peace, love, and his mercy. And in doing that, we can show his love to others around us. So what's our challenge for today? To love. Jesus said to the lawyer, what I believe he wants to say to us today, go and do likewise. Be the merciful. Love your neighbor. Please pray with me. Father, we want to be like the Good Samaritan and take care of the poor, but sometimes we don't do what we believe we should because things get in the way. We don't have enough money, time, or even we don't think we have all the skill to do what needs to be done. Give us the eyes to see what you want us to see, and Holy Spirit, give us the power to live and love like Jesus did. In a time where we are dictated what we can and cannot do, give us the ability to be your hands and feet within the areas where we do find influence around us. Help us when sick to praise you. Help us when we find ourselves in want to praise you. I also wanna thank you for those Samaritans you have placed in our lives, for those people who reached out when we least expected it and helped us carry burdens too heavy for us to carry on our own. Lord, as we go through this next week, help us to see who our neighbors are and at the very least, give us the insight to pray for them when they come to mind. Help us to draw closer to them and to you, to surrender to you the things that weigh us down on this journey. Help us to see clearly through the windows we have placed between us and outside the world. Help us not to be afraid to open those windows and to allow what you have on the outside to bless us on the inside. Bless you and thank you for your scripture that teaches us your truth. And thank you for those you have placed in our lives to help those truths come alive and speak to us through the revelation of your spirit. Thank you for our neighbor. Bless our neighbors. 
Amen. Well, hang in there and the benediction will be along in a moment. God bless you this week. In my wrestling and in my doubt, in my failures you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my trouble sea. Oh, oh, you are the peace in my trouble sea. In the silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my trouble sea. Oh, oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will follow you. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, I will trust the promise, you will carry me safe to shore. Thank you for joining us today in our service, in our offering to the Lord of our praise and our thanksgiving. It's the beginning of our Lenten journey. And this week, as you go through your daily motions, I pray that you take time to ask Father to show you what he wants you to see. Thank him for his many blessings and praise him when moments get difficult. Be the neighbor that you're called to be. And our benediction is found in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 11. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Amen. Across my TV screen, and 
Another broken heart comes into view I saw the pain and I turned my back Why can I do the things I want to? Surrender everything I've got You can have 